Well, I cannot express how much gratitude I have to have Dr. Peter Levine sitting here with us right now. Um, you have been one of uh, the biggest mentors and teachers for me in my uh, work, not only in my own personal work and journey, but also as a therapist. And I know you have impacted more people than we can count. So we're just, we're so appreciative that you're here. Well, thank you. Very kind. <laughs> um, so there's so much. You have an amazing new book out and we just can't wait to get into all of the things. I have like lists of questions, but <laughs> as Danae and I do, because we come from a depth psychology background, we also oh. want to pay honor to allowing the psyche to lead a little bit. Sure. Um, but we want to start with, as we start with everybody that comes on our show, kind of, I mean, it's a long journey for you, I'm sure, but really if you could give our audience, maybe who have never been introduced to you and your work, um, like a synopsis of how did you get here? How did you become who you are, right? Like, what was that journey like for you? I know, I know. I don't know how we're going to fit it in, but if you could. <laughs> Done a lot of things. <laughs> right, right. Um, I mean, basically, my introduction to trauma was in the 1960s, late 1960s. Mm. And at that time, there was no definition of trauma as PTSD the way it is now. Mm. So I had the advantage of not knowing that um, trauma is not a brain disorder or a brain disease, mm. but it's something very, very different. It's something that happens in the body. Yes. Because when the definition as PTSD came out, it was really seen, and this was like 19, what was it, 1981 or 82, and uh, that that was the wisdom of the t of the of the day. That the most you could do is help people uh, with uh, medications or helping them to change some of their ne negative thoughts. Mm. And so that was about it. And if you can believe it, when I first published *Waking the Tiger*, there was only one other book on trauma, mm. wow. and that was Judith Herman's *Trauma and Recovery*. Very important book. Very important book. Anyhow, um, and now there are, I would say, hundred not hundreds, but probably a thousand books on trauma. So it's yeah. interesting how it's coming into the mainstream. But again, my what I first came to realize is when we're frightened or overwhelmed or startled, these are things that the body does. Mm -hmm. So, for example, if you just went outside and you saw somebody was injured, you might you likely get a twisting in your gut. And then if you see that person's really injured, then that twisting gets even more. And then let's say that next night when you're going to bed, all of a sudden you see an image of that person. And again, you notice your guts are twisting. And so, or you, your body is bracing against being hit, say, as a child being hit by, by somebody or just hit emotionally and our shoulders go up like this to protect ourselves. Mm -hmm. Well, when that happens repetitively, the body is literally telling the mind that the trauma is still occurring. Mm -hmm. So the brain first recognizes the injury and recognizes it and gives us the, a body reaction. But when the body reaction maintains itself, then it keeps recirculating as as continuing trauma, as the trauma is continuing over and over. And that won't change my experience until we change that information that's coming from the body to the brain. Mm -hmm. So here is again, I'm bracing against being hit. So I might just say, because I might, I would very likely notice that if I were working with somebody and I might gradually bring their attention to it. Mm -hmm. And, it, and to, sometimes people have chronic pain, and then there's almost, almost well, if it's, if it's chronic pain, unless there's an actual injury or something like that, it's almost always uh, due to uh, uh, prolonged tension. So again, if you, and you can try this, because most of us do have some tension in our shoulders. So I, I might ask the person, well, if you if your shoulders if you the tension even increased more in your shoulders, would your shoulders want to move? Could they move? 
yes, they would move. They would go up towards my ears. Mm -hmm. Okay, now, if you can do that very slowly and really, really put your mind to it and just let them go up a little bit and then release mm -hmm. and then just wait and notice what's going on in your body. Mm -hmm. So there's most likely to be a discharge. They're coming tingling, vibration, gentle shaking, trembling, and so forth, feeling of more spaciousness. So these are, again, all the things that the body does that informs the mind that they should be on threat alert, even mm -hmm. though there's no actual danger. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Dr. Levine, I'm curious, as someone who really pioneered the conversation around trauma, what your thoughts are on the way that we talk about trauma today, you know, you were yeah. saying initially there were there was only one other book where people were exploring it as a concept. How do you feel about the extent to which it almost feels like everything is trauma or we've sort of made the conversation about trauma so much of our, yeah. a part of our cultural vernacular that it almost sometimes feels minimizing? Yeah. I'm afraid I don't, almost don't know how to answer that question. <laughs> I mean, trauma is the most belittled, ignored, important mm -hmm. cause of suffering and illness mm -hmm. in the world. And then on the other side, everything becomes trauma. Mm -hmm. Right. Now, things can affect us, but it doesn't mean that they're trauma, at least in the sense of PTSD. Mm -hmm. But the, one of the things that I've learned in working with people for 50 years is that trauma is trauma no matter what the source, no mm -hmm. matter what causes it. I wouldn't even use the word. I would say that our bodies, our psyche get overwhelmed. Mm -hmm. You know, probably one of the best definitions of trauma is the one uh, that uh, Freud proposed in, I think it was 1960. Now, this was before he went off in that tangent about people <laughs> wanting to sleep with their mothers. <laughs> And, and he wrote that trauma is a breach in the protective barrier against stimulation leading to feelings of overwhelming helplessness. Mm -hmm. I would just change it to uh, trauma is a breach in the protective barrier against overstimulation mm -hmm. leading to feelings of overwhelming helplessness. Mm -hmm. I, I think that's a pretty good, you know, pretty good um, description of, you know, of how trauma affects us. So again, I, when I work with people, I, I don't, I'm, I'm long retired from actually doing, you know, private sessions, but so many things may have occurred in the person's life or not even in their life, but in the life of their parents, grandparents, great, great, right. and so forth. And that was one of the things that I really started to realize when I was working with more and more people that it didn't start here. Mm -hmm. uh, a friend of mine, a colleague, wrote a very nice book. I think it says it's, it's called "It Didn't Start with You." It didn't start with didn't you. Start yeah, with you. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. And so it's now. I think people are really looking at this much more seriously. When mm -hmm. I first talked about it, um, I was considered to be a little bit wacko. I mean, mm -hmm. how could somebody affect something that happened to your generation? Mm -hmm. And we know, of course, now that. Uh, the epigenetic transmission is significant, can mm -hmm. be very significant, but it's more than that. We get specific information from our ancestors, not just trauma, but in some cases, life preserving or life enhancing information. I think the first time I came to understand this was, it must've been 1989. There was a, a famous airplane crash, United 232 from mm -hmm. Denver to Chicago, and the rear engine, DC-10, uh, blew out and it cut all the, the uh, hydraulic lines, so the mm -hmm. plane couldn't steer. Mm -hmm. So what they tried to do is just use the engines, like put one engine stronger and then the other and so forth, to try to get it at least a, a little bit stabilized. So they landed in a, a regional airport, small airport, and the fuselage broke into pieces. There were fireballs and so forth. And so I'm working with this one woman who was in that flight. And in somatic experience, I, I, I talk about this quite extensively in the autobiography. Mm -hmm. We don't go for people's traumas. We go to the place where they first felt safe or cared for. Mm -hmm. 
and so Katie, that's the name I'll give her, um, uh, her body took her out into this cornfield where she could feel the sun on her back and she knew that she survived, that she mm -hmm. was safe. So then we go back to in the airplane. She's upside down now because the fuselage is turned upside down. And she just slowly opens the seatbelt and lets herself down to the ground. It's dark, it's black, there's smoke. She doesn't know what to do. And she hears these words, Katie, go, go to the light, mm -hmm. go to the light and escape. And she saw a pinpoint of light. Mm -hmm. And so she crawled there and, and, and then was able to escape. But where did that come from? Katie, go to the light, escape. Mm -hmm. Those are the words that she heard. Well, it turns out that both her father and grandfather were in airplane crashes mm -hmm. and they both survived by crawling oh, through the light. <laughs> so this life-saving information got passed along. So, I, yeah, and, uh, and I think that's really important to, to understand mm -hmm. how valuable and life-saving. You know, I was doing a, a workshop at Esalen some years ago and I happened to be working together with a young man who was from the Crow Nation and a young woman who was Navajo. And what came up in, in the session was this chant in the, the man's uh, own language from a grandfather, great-grandfather. And the words, this chant just came through him. And we were all so, I can imagine, really mm. deeply, deeply, deeply moved. Mm. Yeah, that's that's interesting, right? Like this idea of we've been talking a lot, I feel like, in in today's society about ancestral trauma and healing ancestral trauma. But to hear you talk about how there is both trauma mm -hmm. that is passed down and also life saving wisdom. Right. Um, that feels life empowering. Life enhancing wisdom. Life enhancing. Right. That's a better way to put it. It, it feels so, so powerful. Um and and kind of power giving when mm -hmm. I can say um, yes, of course, this this trauma was passed down, and also these these life affirming, these life giving um, strategies or whatever, also right were given to me, and those are just as important, if not more important. Yes, absolutely, mm. absolutely. Yeah, you know, when I first started, well, if, if it's okay, let me just kind of to orient to that question. If I can talk a little bit about the book I just finished, The Autobiography of Trauma. Please. Yeah. Um, first of all, talking about not going directly into the trauma. Mm -hmm. Because a number of things happened to me which were quite violent and where I was deeply unsupported in a situation where there was literally, literally life threat. And so I was starting to experience some disturbing sensations and a flashes of, of images. Mm. And I, and this must have been about 30 years ago. And so I decided it was time for me to take a dose of my own medicine. <laughs> you know, Chiron in from the Greek, <laughs> the way I understand it, it's the wounded healer. Mm -hmm. And we're all wounded in, in our own ways. If we're healers, we have to deal with our own wounding. It's mm. essential. Otherwise, we can't really be present for our clients, for another person. So uh, the following image, uh, the following image, actually a memory came up when I was about four or five years old and it was my birthday. And at night, my parents came into the bedroom, my bedroom, and laid a track for a uh, model airplane, uh, airplane, model train they went underneath the bed, out into the room, down again in an mm -hmm. oval, and then back underneath the bed again. So I awoke, and you can imagine, well, I literally jumped out of bed. I ran over to the transformer, and I controlled the speed. And I also made the horn go, you know, through. <laughs> in that moment, I knew that I was cared about, that mm. I was and there's a thing that's now pretty clear that if somebody, even they have had tremendous amount of trauma 
if they had someone who cared for them, who loved them, mm -hmm. they'll be okay. It, it might be some rough going, but they will be okay. So then this led to the following body sensation. Uh, I remembered when I would come home from school, I would, must have been in the eighth grade, and I would run back home. I would eat my milk and my cookies, and I would just run to this park. Mm. And in the park, I would go down, to, because during this time, and this is really where so much of the trauma comes from, my father was asked to testify against the mafia Don Johnny Diaguardo, Johnny Diaguardo. Wow. He was the Al Capone mm -hmm. of uh, you know of New York, and he was murderous. You know the movie the the Goodfellows and also the Irishman. Mm -hmm. He was portrayed as one as the most violent of all of the those people. So you can imagine mm -hmm. somebody you want to mess with. So um, and and he basically told my father or the mafia told my father that if he testifies against Johnny Dio that he will find his family face down in the East River. Mm -hmm. So our lives were threatened. Mm -hmm. We, me and my brother uh, knew, my brothers knew something was wrong, but it was never talked about. And we were mm -hmm. never told, it's okay, we're going to take care of you. This is a difficult time, but we will mm -hmm. take care of you. So we didn't have that, I didn't have that message. So I really felt my life energy in a way draining. Mm -hmm. But when I would come home from my milk and cookies and jump over the this wrought iron fence and down in the bushes, there was a running track, another oval, it's called the Oval, uh, oval uh, Reservoir Oval Park, it used to be a reservoir. And I would run on that, in that, uh, that cinder block um, tr running track. And I could start to feel life coming back into my legs. Mm -hmm. And again, I worked really to embody that sensation. So I'm working again with one of my students, uh, who then she became my, well, my therapist, my guide. And um, I remember one time climbing the fence and I knew something was wrong and I could see see off to the left, there was a bunch of, I'm sure they were mafia people, they were smoking mm -hmm. cigarettes, and um, and they had these motorcycle hats, but, and my body tensed, mm. and I knew that something was wrong, and obviously I didn't know what it was, so I tried to quickly go down into the bushes, but then somebody grabbed me from behind and threw me to the ground. Mm where I was uh, violently raped. Mm -hmm. And when I look back at it, actually in writing this autobiography, it was meant to only be for myself. I was never thinking about writing it as a book, but some friends really mm -hmm. me, yeah, supported me to actually put it out there because it could help other people. And yes. I was convinced of that. So I did let it go. It was a difficult decision, believe mm -hmm. me. So, okay, so anyhow, uh, I'm pretty sure that they did this for me to tell my parents to also put more pressure on them, mm. more pressure on my father. At least that was what I kind of put together. But I never told my parents. Mm. And in a way, I didn't tell myself. Mm. And that's what happens when we've had severe trauma. That's often what happens. Yeah. Put it away we wall it off so it's not in our consciousness yes it's there in a put it in the recesses of a corner so getting back to when i was having these uh troubling sensations and images that's when i again asked my uh, my student my now my my guide to help me with this and that's what came up hmm but also that I wasn't destroyed by that. There was mm -hmm. still power in me. And that, again, was one of the important bases of somatic experiencing. Is we, we go, again, not just for the trauma, but what supported the person's healing. 
the book, actually the book is called An Autobiography of Trauma, A Healing Journey, mm-hmm. my story. And, um, and by the way, I had, as I said, I, I didn't have any intention to, to publish it as a book. Um, but my, one of my friends uh, really encouraged me to do that. Mm. And, um, and also, uh, she let me reflect uh, on what I was writing. Yeah. So she was really a tremendous support. And then the first time that I was talking about this book in public, it was in December. It was at the, what do they call it, uh, Evolution of Psychotherapy Conference. Mm-hmm. Several thousand people. Yeah, used. I saw you there a few years back. <laughs> right. I said I, I saw you there pre-pandemic. I was there. Oh, oh, yeah. oh! Wow. Mm-hmm. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> interesting. Interesting. Uh, so anyhow, um, I just my uh, my I froze. My I couldn't get the words out. Yeah. And but then uh, I remembered what some of my friends and colleagues and other people had written mm. about the book, about me and mm. about the book. And I literally could feel them at my side and supporting me from behind. Mm-hmm. And that support also allowed me to make this in public for the first time. Yeah. And now that the book is out, um, again, this was the last chance I had to not let it go out Mm. and but oh yeah yeah (laughs) there's there's another side story about this as well I'm not jumping around but um how do I want to put this um well I'll come back to it or not but anyhow clearly this is something I was supposed to do. Oh, yeah, mm. that's what I remember. Mm. The Lord was really encouraging me. I was really reticent. And, but I couldn't make up my mind. Mm-hmm. In, as I talk about it in the, in the autobiography, some of the most important uh, changes in my life came initially from dreams. Right. Mm. And so, you know, I, again, I was, at best ambivalent i you know i was definitely uh anxious about doing that and um so i had the following dream in the dream i'm standing by a a big field Mm -hmm. large field and in my hand i'm holding a number of pages in both hands and you could see it was a manuscript of some kind Mm because it you know it was typewritten and i remember in the dream looking from left to right, right to left, in this indecision. Mm. In this indecision, a strong breeze came from behind me and took all of these papers and blew them into the to the air and down into that meadow mm. to land where they might land. And so when I awoke, I realized that my decision had been made, mm. that I was going to let it go wherever it landed mm-hmm. and and i'm glad i followed that dream it was <clears> difficult <throat> it was very difficult but i really and i'm glad so much that my friend really yeah I, yes. yeah well dr levine first of all just thank you so much for sharing that with us and i think <clears throat> excuse me there's i do think there's so much um power in the liberation that others are able to find in the truth that we share that Mm -hmm. allow people to know that they are not alone with something that they have been carrying and maybe holding shame around. And, you know, I was thinking about something I've heard you say in talks in the past around, um, you know, that shame allows a child to feel like they have a a modicum of control over situations and how much that really sort of reframed the way that I think about like what that gives a child in a Mm. world of chaos when they feel like there are all of these things happening that I have no control over, but if it's mine and I did it and I'm responsible, then somehow that gives me this experience of control. And that I'm bad and that I embody badness itself. Yeah. Mm. Again, this is, you know, 
shame strangulates the spirit, the soul. Yeah. And and you know I've thought about it. I I uh, found there's a specific posture of shame, mm. and then I can work with people with this body posture very gradually, like at the beginning. Yeah. Very gradually going into it and coming out and going into it. And also coming to self-compassion because mm. that was the only way the child could feel that they had any control at all, which they didn't because mm-hmm. they were, you know, they were small and the adults were giants. So uh, the only way we can get some sense that we're, we're going to be okay is uh, if we were the cause of our mistreatment, if it was yeah. our fault. And to change that, I think, uh, you know, Gabor, one of the endorsements he wrote was uh, from searing pain, a journey from searing pain to joy, from mm-hmm. self-hate to self-love. Yeah. And again, gradually, as I worked these events and how I responded and, and, and who was there or who should have been there, yeah. You know, this thing started, to, this, my story started to unfold. Mm. And, um, and, and I believe that's true for all of us. Yes. That we all, well, we've all, anybody who's watching the podcast has had some kind of trauma. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, but, um, but it doesn't have to be a life sentence. Yes. Right. Yes. And given the tools, without tools, trauma rules. With tools, trauma can be addressed. And um, and also, I, I deeply believe that we all have our own stories to tell. Yes. And I, in the book, I support people in trying to, and in, in deciding to tell their story, even if it's only to themselves. Mm-hmm. And then to see, you know, where they would want to go from that. Um, I think that was the message that I really wanted to get out, that bad stuff happens, but it doesn't have to be a life sentence. And one of the things that I have always valued so much in watching you work and in studying SE and and even reading this book is the way that you work with the body. Let me see if I can figure out how how I want to frame this. There's a, a slowing down that is so imperative that as our our world and our society continues to speed up, I find that is even harder to grasp sometimes and yet is so imperative in the actual releasing of the story of the shame of working with the trauma. Mm-hmm. I have, I have actually used the words multiple times when I have told people who you know are not in this world or who don't know you. And I have said, watch him on YouTube, work with somebody that pulls him from the audience. I've seen it live. He works. It's like you're watching a magician because you don't know the tricks that are going on. And it's not tricks obviously, but it's, it's so subtle and it's so slow that it almost is like magic, Dr. Levine. And I know it's not, but I will say (laughs) as an observer, that's what it seems like. Yes. And one of my jobs was to disprove that. (laughs) (laughs) I know. Something that was was learnable. And, you know, Einstein said that there are two ways to look at the world. Hmm. One is that nothing is a miracle. And the other is that everything is a miracle. And I think I'm okay. You know, people have said I was like a magician or a shaman. (laughs) I, I, I. I, and again, at the time, I, you know, because I wanted to make sure that the work would be recognizable. So I wanted to, you know, not, not say, oh, th- this is something only I could do, mm-hmm. or that I was a magician or a shaman. Although I've had the great benefit over the years of meeting uh, different shamans in different parts of the world. I also go over that, you know, in one of the chapters in the book. Um, and, uh, and I've learned so much from them. Mm-hmm. but not in the way I might thought it would come across. Mm-hmm. So, for, and, and oh, and about slowing down. Yes. Somatic experiencing is about slowing down in a world which is more and more speeding up. And often when, you know, I've worked with people and they work through some of this trauma, 
and they through slowing things down through taking things step by step by step by step they find that they're able to slow down more in their whole world in yes. their whole life yes and i think that's one of the gifts the side effects of trauma resolved trauma transformed is we take a much slower way of being with ourselves yes and being in the world and goodness gracious <laughs> we need that at this in this time in in in, in time in history well and it feels a bit like um maybe like pendulum is the word I'm thinking, because I can even recognize it in myself when I, when I'm able to catch myself in a state of speeding everything up and, and getting a little ahead of myself, if I can stop and go back into the slowness and go back into my body, there's something that I've missed. There's something mm -hmm. that I'm trying to avoid. There's something yeah. that I've skipped over, right? On purpose, yeah. um, that, yeah. that I'm attempting to run ahead of almost. Mm -hmm. Right. And so that's why I think so much of your work has been profound for me, even in my own work, is just sitting and saying, okay, you're getting a little too ahead of yourself. Why? There's something yeah. that you're running ahead of. That's right. Or running away from. Or running away from. Yeah. I mean, look, we're all running away from stuff. <laughs> uh, that's just a given. Mm -hmm. um, and in doing that, we, 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 get, we lose our essence. We move, we mm. move what is really precious within ourselves. Yeah. You know, when I, at the last chapter in the book, it's titled Living My Dying Through the Eye of a Needle. Mm -hmm. And I'm at the age now where I clearly have less years in the future than I have had in the past. And, uh, and that was the idea, really, of, of starting to pen this this uh, journal, which again mm -hmm. became the book. And um, at the end, I really felt like this circle that I came back to the child, mm -hmm. the 18 month old child, even though he had already experienced trauma, he still had vitality. He still had excitement. He still Oh, let me show you the picture, actually. I think I, uh, <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> That's okay. Yes. Oh, oh, <laughs> stop it. Look at that face. <laughs> yeah. And so that kind of took me full circle, mm -hmm. uh, starting, you know, with the trauma, mm -hmm. of, of coming to through the trauma, mm -hmm. and then finally of coming back to myself. Mm -hmm. And so in living my dying, it's really living my living while I'm alive. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Dr. Levine, there's something I wanted to ask you, but I feel like it's one of those opportunities where we have you. I'm curious to pick your brain on something that, you know, um, you touch on psychedelics a little bit mm -hmm. in the That's book good. and it's something that I just have, you know, curiosity as well as complex feelings about as I mm -hmm. witness it unfolding mm -hmm. with a lot of my clients. And I think you hold sort of the interesting juxtaposition of sort of, you know, naming that psychedelics were a gateway to like certain mm -hmm. areas of curiosity, but also such deep respect in the way you speak about indigenous populations mm -hmm. and um, those traditions. And I'm just kind of curious to hear your thoughts on the psychedelic movement as it's showing have, up in trauma work thoughts, today. Thoughts of, of <laughs> I thought you might. Um, first of all, in for full disclosure, I came to Berkeley in 1964. Mm-hmm. So it was all about sex, drugs, and rock and roll. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, but now I've looked at, and the, as the Judy Collins song goes, I've looked at cloud from both sides now. <laughs> and I, I, think, I, the, I think what I write about it is use of psychedelics, promises, and pitfalls. Mm, yes. And a few things. Uh, first of all, it's not for everybody. Mm -hmm. And... Also, it's important to prepare for it and to do follow up. Mm -hmm. And um, and and then not only to do follow up, but to really make sure that this gets in the body. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a saying in Papua, Papua New Guinea that not that knowledge 
doesn't exist unless it's in the body, I think mm. they say, unless it's in the muscles. Mm. And so that's vitally important because otherwise, if we're just, as I did in the 60s, uh, you know, just doing these, these catalysts, these psychedelics over and over again, it's not really sticking. Yes. It's not really changing how we are with ourselves and with our bodies. And that takes hard work. Mm -hmm. you know, I, I think I said something like, for every psychedelic uh, experience, we need at least four or five, uh, four, uh, 15 or 20 uh, non-catalyst non uh, follow-up work. Yeah. And Everyone I, hear that? <laughs> yeah. Pause, Everyone listen listening to, to Dr. Levine on that one? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, yeah. So, and also, are you working with somebody who's really experienced, who really mm -hmm. knows about trauma? Mm -hmm. And you know, otherwise, again, it can just be, you know, going for the God molecule. Mm -hmm. And and it's it's not that simple. Mm -hmm. It's not that simple. So, again, I, I see great possibility, really good possibilities. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and I've spoken out and I've spoken to some of the people who are doing some of the psychedelic work and some of the, you know, about my concerns. Mm -hmm. And I think that that they've taken that and I think that making changes. So, again, it's like one of the things which I think is essential is before doing the psychedelic experience to just have the two therapists, usually it's a man and a woman, uh, uh, and the person is wearing the sleep mask, which is what mm -hmm. you do usually with psychedelic journeys, and earphones, mm -hmm. and just listening to the same types of sounds or music, and to do that for, for at least a few hours. So you're doing something where you're really seeing what comes up, mm -hmm. and then if it's time to do a journey, then at least you know that this is the right time to, to do it. Right. Like your body has, in essence, been prepared in some way for what yes. it's going to go into so that it's exactly. not such a shock to the system. I mean, of course, yes. it's going to be, but that at least gives it some baseline of, yes. I know this. Yes. <laughs> yeah. and you don't want to shock the nervous system. Right. Mm -hmm. Because often if you do that, then you just re you reactivate the trauma. You know, there, I, I mean, in the somatic experiencing trainings, when I first started teaching what I was developing to a group of about 12 or 15 therapists from Berkeley, they would come out every week or two. And they call it my tree house in Wildcat Canyon, just outside of Berkeley. Mm. And I would, uh, you know, try to teach them what I was doing. Mm. And, um, and then strangely enough, uh, uh, we, I would work with somebody and then try to explain what I was doing. So again, doing this kind of thing before we do, uh, you know, a, a, a trip. Mm -hmm. uh, and again, there are many psychedelics and they have different effects and they have different effects on different people. Mm -hmm. So again, it has a lot to know about it. And, you know, and it, it, like so many things, it can become proselytizing that, you know, that this is the answer for yes. everything. And I was going to say, oh, I wish it was, but in a way I don't because it wouldn't be the truth. Mm. Right. You know, and actually in, I mean, no, I'm jumping around here, but in writing the autobiography, the commitment I made to myself was that I would tell my truth no matter where it went, mm. no matter where it went. And there's a, a Jewish saying that, how does it go? Uh, what is truer than truth? Mm -hmm. The answer, the story. And again, mm -hmm. we all have our stories, our, our valuable stories to tell to ourselves and possibly to others, but to the right others, to the person who is respectful and yes. not just to tell it randomly mm -hmm. because that can be, we can be mobbed or abused. Yes. We do that. So, yeah, getting back to slowing down, mm. we really in our in our society, um, things are going at such a wreck wreck wreck, 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 wreck. 
Yeah. Um, that we don't have time to live. No. To, you know, to really experience life, mm-hmm. to experience deepening of relationships. You know, I mean, I've been at a restaurant or different places and there's a whole bunch, or people going out on a date and they actually, what they're doing is looking at their phone. Yes. Yeah. They're not making any contact with each other. And we're becoming, Einstein said it, a, a nation of idiots, mm-hmm. of <laughs> emotional idiots. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, because we don't have that sense of connection to ourselves and connection mm. with others. And that's really, I think, what life is about. Yeah, yeah you actually said um, in one of the, tra- the chapters, you talked about society being fragmented. I wrote this down because it was so profound for me and missing deep connection, right? Um, you specifically told the story of the woman who had lost her twins Um, and how you witnessed her being brought back into the community, right, through that community-based healing. And I just thought we are such a people of a lack when it comes to that, right? We're so lonely. Yeah, we're so lonely. And so individual. I mean, and that that has its positive aspects. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, this machine that I'm sitting in front and talking to you Mm-hmm. You know, that was something that was developed by people who were quite individualistic. Yes. But there's a high cost to that. Yeah. Anyhow, you know, uh, I was interested to find out maybe if I could a little bit more about how different shamanic cultures deal with trauma. Mm-hmm. And in in Portuguese, uh, uh, Brazilian and Portuguese, and also in... Uh, uh, in, oh, I think probably also in uh, uh, in Spanish, there's a word susto, mm-hmm. S-U-S-T-O, and it literally means fright paralysis. Mm. So when I learned about that, I thought, oh, wow, this, this must be about trauma. This must be about how they work with trauma. So I was visiting, I had the possibility to visit this, um, this chief of the Kranaki tribe it took us about 18 hours to get there, including three hours, two or three hours in the hot noonday sun. <laughs> when finally got there, I mean, I was just sweating profusely. And the chief took me to this place right behind their house. There was a, 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 a plastic pipe that went in between two rocks and there was a spring there. So it was like a shower. Mm. So he took me there. <laughs> I went under the shower and finally I started to realize, oh gosh, I'm alive here. And then he invited me to come out with him on the other side of the house. uh, And there was a mat and and we were sitting together underneath a uh, a mango tree. Mm -hmm. And he had a flute and he was playing the flute and there were a number of other flutes. And I asked him, I said, is it okay if I play the flute with you? And he said, that's why they're here. So the two of us were playing the flute together and all of a sudden I was in a different state of consciousness. Mm -hmm. And so I asked him the question about Susti. Well, his daughter, the princess from the tribe, she was the first person to go to university, to go to college. And she, so she, she had told her father about what she learned about Susti, but also about trauma. Mm -hmm. And so he said something like, um, trauma is not, well, in one of my other books, in an unspoken voice, mm-hmm. I, I write that trauma is not just what happens to us, or it's primarily what happens to us, but what happens to us in the absence of that connected, present, empathetic other. Mm-hmm. And um, so anyhow, I, in, in a way, I realized the importance of that. But he really extended that that understanding because mm-hmm. he said that, you know, when there's a, 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 a tear in the society, in the fabric of the society, mm-hmm. that's the fertile ground at which trauma can grow, systems mm-hmm. can go. And there was an example of that they described. There was this woman from the tribe. She had, had diabetes, so uh, she was pregnant pregnant with twins so she w- was taken to the hospital which was a few hours that was a, the nearest um, hospital and tragically 
the the babies died, the twins died. Mm -hmm. And she was in a profound depression, of course. And they start they tr tried all different kinds of drugs, medications, but to no avail. And finally, they wanted to give her shock treatment. Mm -hmm. And so they had to get an okay from, you know, somebody at the tribe. And they were mm -hmm. horrified with this. And they snuck out in the middle of the night, fashioned a ladder up to the window for her room. And they brought her down and brought her back to the tribe. <laughs> and see, she was just sitting like this, just in despair. But they didn't require anything. She was just allowed just to be there. Mm -hmm. And when they would do their movement, their drumming, their rituals, uh, they're very powerful. You know, when they let us do it, um, w within a few minutes, uh, I was in a different, I was in an altered state of consciousness. And then one time, one of them started to, one of the people in the tribe started to cry, and another one, and then this, they were all crying, and this woman started to cry. Mm -hmm. And then... She was out of the depression. I mean, she was still processing the grief of the loss, but she was no longer in despair. Yeah. And that's what is necessary that we've lost because we are not community oriented anymore, or by and large, we're not. And um, there was also uh, an anthropologist that I came across, Colin Turnbull. And he was in what's uh, pejoratively called the subjectivist um, uh, type of anthropologist. So he actually lived with these pygmy, the forest pygmy people mm -hmm. for uh, three years. Mm -hmm. And he did make notes, of course, but he wasn't like checking how many times did they do this and then what did they do next and so forth. But he really learned about the feeling. Hmm. And what happened when somebody lost somebody dear to them, the group would come together and they would cry together mm -hmm. all night long. Mm -hmm. And then the next day in the morning light, they would go in deep into the forest and we, they would drum and dance in ecstasy, in joy. Mm -hmm. And I'm teaching a class in Germany this year, which is called Grief, Joy, and return to the true self. Mm -hmm. but see, we we are just so emotionally illiterate. Yes. With these kinds of things, and um, I, and we have much to learn. We have much to learn from people who are different than we are. Yes. Can we just keep you all day? <laughs> <laughs> I want to have you just continue to tell us all of the stories. I love it. There's so much wisdom here. I, um, we want to make sure that we're respectful of your time, though, and we and we have a, a quick little round of lightning questions that we ask all of our guests. Okay. If you would appease okay. us, that was the fastest hour ever. I like. No. I know. I'm like, oh, right, okay. the hour. Okay. <laughs> all right. Well, um, Dr. Levine, the first question that we always ask is, who have been your greatest teachers, mentors, ah, people who have impacted your journey up to this point? Yes. Actually, there's a section in the book on the autobiography <laughs> that's exactly about that. Mm. First one is titled, The Four Most Important Women in My Life. Mm. And the chapter after that is The Four Most Important Men in My Life. Beautiful. And um, the important women have really... When I first came out to Berkeley, I was so disembodied. I didn't know I had a body. Mm -hmm. And um, my f my friend Jack, he was at the uh, the Green Gulch uh, Meditation Center, mm -hmm. and there was a class given or a workshop given by a woman named Charlotte Selvers, and she's pretty amazing. Uh, when she was 98, she eloped with her 50-year-old gardener. Okay. <laughs> yes. Taught until this. the age of 104. Wow. So anyhow, there was this um, workshop that was in this wonderful, this magnificent church at mm. the top of Gary Street in San Francisco. And my friend Jack was able to get me in, even though I wasn't part of that, you know, that meditation. And so I was there, and there were all of the different uh, monks who were, you know, from that center. And we would 
have to hold a stone and feel the weight and feel the texture and feel the temperature. Mm -hmm. And we'd just be walking around the room, feeling our feet, feel, I mean, just, <laughs> I thought this is the most ridiculous thing. And I remember <laughs> tapping uh, an eye with one of the monks and I said, how was this for you, this class? And he said, mm, big headache. <laughs> Finally, at the end, she had us lay down on the floor and she gave us some guidance to feel our breath coming in to our in from our feet into our lungs, mm -hmm. going from our lungs down into our belly and into our feet. And of course, I, you know, I'm a, a scientist at that point. I'm doing my doctoral work and I realized something like that's impossible. You can't breathe through your feet. <laughs> Well, boy, I discovered how wrong I was, but it was the awareness <laughs> mm -hmm. bringing together. And then at the end of the workshop, it was at the uh, twilight and we walked out and we looked down into the valley and across to the Bay Bridge. Mm -hmm. And it was the most beautiful sight that I had ever seen. So I mm -hmm. realized something profound had happened by learning to attend to my body. Mm -hmm. and that was really the beginning. And then I worked with another woman named Magda Proskauer, who was a physiotherapist who did breathing work. And then with a woman named Ida Rolf, who developed Rolfing, mm -hmm. and how important it was to be taken under her tutelage. Mm -hmm. And then finally, a woman named Mira Mira Rothenberg who wrote a book called The Children with Emerald Eyes. Mm -hmm. And I spent much time with her. And, and the way she worked with these kids, she followed her gut, she followed her heart. I mean, she was also an incredibly articulate writer, mm. but she was, and she came from, she also wrote, but she really wrote from her guts and from her heart. Mm. And so these are four, the four women that have been so uh, formative in my developing the work. And, and I, I just want to honor them and also these other four men for what they've taken me and taken me under their wing. Mm -hmm. And I've always pondered, what was it that brought us together? Yeah. And the nearest thing I can come up with is that we are part of a cabal, that there was something that mm -hmm. really, a force that I wasn't aware of, I don't even know if they were aware of, that was bringing us together. Mm. Believe that. Love it. I'm guessing I know who the your friend Jack was. I'm thinking it's Mr. Jack Cornfield. <laughs> no, it wasn't. Oh, was it? I was like, that sounds like something Jack Cornfield would bring you into. <laughs> that, that could have been Jack Cornfield. That could have been. Jack Kaplan. Okay. It also started with a K. <laughs> yeah. And, no, Jack and I have become good friends. And I just adore he and, and his wife, Trudy. Yeah. yeah he wrote some uh, a beautiful endorsement of the book. Yeah. You know, I think that uh, on the Oh, brilliant, moving and wise. Yeah. That's right. And I, again, I was just, again, touched that so many of my friends that have really stood with me yeah. in this difficult task mm. and gave me the support and the courage to move yes. forward with it. Yeah. Okay. So the second question is, and what comes to mind first when you think of this concept or this word flow, right? So that state that we get into where time just doesn't exist. Yeah. Well, trauma is about fixity hmm. and transforming trauma, trauma is going from fixity to flow. Hmm. And flow is that sense of, of energetic movement in our bodies. Um, that is experienced as flow, as yes. this inner movement. And, yes. you know, I can never pronounce this guy's name. He He's famous for uh, writing a book called Flow. Mm -hmm. And he really talks about that, uh, Mikhail something or other. And um, this is a state that I, I think this is our natural state of being. I think mm -hmm. that's what flow is. But mm -hmm. trauma and over-socialization has taken us away from that. Yes. And healing trauma, transforming trauma is a, surprisingly takes us to that sense of flow, inner flow. And again, it's one of the, the wonderful side effects of trauma transformed. Yeah. Is that sense in our bodies, in our being, in our whole being of flow, of movement, of inner 
movement and yes. its flow. Mm. Beautiful. Dr. Levine, what breaks your heart? Oh, oh God. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> the state of the world. Mm-hmm. You know, what's going on in the Middle East. Mm-hmm. Um, it's heartbreaking. Mm-hmm. It's absolutely heartbreaking. Um, yeah. Yeah. And of course, what's also going on with the the state, the you know the what's the word for that? Where the where the destruction of our natural environment yeah. is um, also so deeply troubling. But we need to find a presence in ourselves, the flow, and in ourselves, and not get sucked into that. Yes. So in Tibetan, there's a, this is seen as a Kalakari uh, period. And it's a period of extreme disintegration. Mm. But if we get through it, there'll be light on the other side. That's right. And I, I kind of hold that in my heart. So do we. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay, so the last question. Oh. Don't worry. It is, what's your favorite food? <laughs> oh my gosh, my favorite food. Boy, you're not easy asking these easy questions. <laughs> oh gosh. <laughs> my favorite food. Well, you know, um, I'm on the road a lot traveling. Mm. Or it was. Mm. A little bit less now, but still I am. And I'm so glad when I get home and I can make my own food. Mm. And even though some of the food that I, I am exposed to when I'm traveling, some of it's wonderful in many ways, but really it's such a wonderful, it's just a relief to get home and to cook my sweet potatoes and my vegetables oh. mm-hmm. and just enjoy them and, and, yeah. Mm, I feel that. Beautiful. Well, Dr. Levine, I just, I really want to thank you not only for the way that I know that you have impacted both Vanessa and I and the work that we do, but countless others, but also, you know, I was thinking as you were talking about what breaks your heart, how much the way that you speak and have always spoken about our ability to transcend these traumatic experiences that we can make and uh, Mm -hmm. transform, thank you, Um, that we can sort of make an identity out of and that Mm -hmm. it is actually possible to not have that be the case. And it's always just felt so unbelievably inspiring to me. Um, A lot of times in a world that tells us that this is just going to be what this is, you know, so thank you for the way that you speak about resiliency and the way that we are capable of um, slowing down and doing this work. Resilience is the core here. Yes. Yes, and that's what in somatic experiencing what we help people evoke is that resilience Mm -hmm. yeah yes thank you so much dr levine oh and if they want to know more about somatic experience they can go to somatic experiencing one word.com yes it also connects with my nonprofit that lists all the therapists in the world who have been trained in this way yep and um yeah yeah we're gonna put it all in the show notes too Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah. Anyhow, I'm sure you'll take care. No, we're gonna we're gonna link the book. <laughs> Got to go out and get that. We're gonna put all the SE, exp- you know, all that info. So if you were driving and you weren't able to take notes while you were listening, just go ahead and go to the show notes, and it'll all link out. Well, thank you, Denny, and thank you, Vanessa. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.